this is Christina here with the Stage Nature Center. I'll be getting started here in just a moment. Sorry for the delayed start. Just having a little bit of trouble getting connected here. We'll get started here in just a moment. Hello, I see we have some people signing in. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get started here in just a moment. Just trying to pull up the um, presentation on another device so I can see your comments. All right. Hi, this is Christina here with the Stage Nature Center. Uh, excited to be here with you all again today to do another live uh, program here on Facebook from the Stage Nature Center here in Troy, Michigan. I hope everyone is doing well and uh, thanks for hanging in there while I was getting connected <laughs> um, to Facebook here. Um, just a, a few quick reminders. Like I said, I'm at the Stage Nature Center here in Troy, Michigan. We're going to be talking about wildlife babies again today. I know we talked about wildlife babies a, a couple days ago on Tuesday. I wasn't able to get through all of the videos that I wanted to share with you guys about some different wildlife babies, partly because of the technical difficulties we had on Tuesday. So fingers crossed that it will um, go okay today having some issues with the, the presentation this morning. So let's hope that it doesn't freeze up. If it does freeze up, <laughs> I will do the best I can to get back to you guys as quickly as possible. Um, so we the building is open now. We reopened here on Tuesday and um, we're open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So come on out and visit us. We do have some changes to our regulations in terms of visiting the Nature Center just to make everybody safe. Um, so right now we're allowing 10 people maximum in the building at a time. We're also asking people to wear face masks um, and to keep social distancing. So if you do come visit, please keep those things in mind. You can go out on the trails without coming into the building if you don't want to come into the building right now. We are leaving the trails open even while the building is open, so that way you can enjoy the trails as well. But of course, if you go on the trails, please continue to practice social distancing, be respectful of others, and just make sure you're safe. Um, also, we are we just started doing live programs again, so we're really excited to do that. We did uh, Little Acorns just a few days ago, um, and uh, that was, we had a nice small group for that, and uh, hopefully the kiddos enjoyed going out on the trails, and uh, I'm going to be doing an owl tour this evening, although we are booked full for that, but I will be doing more owl tours coming up where I will take you all out to 
see the live owls that we have here at the Stage Nature Center that are our resident owls that are rehabilitated and non-releasable. So I'm excited to be doing live programs again with also some modifications to make sure everybody is safe and healthy. Uh, I'm going to continue to do these live programs through the end of June here. So I will have a few more after this. Uh, if you have it in your means to donate, we would still appreciate that support as we are have had a few months without programming and that's our primary um, mode of funding for the Stage Nature Center since we are a nonprofit organization. So again, thank you to everyone who has donated, who has supported us. Um, I've loved seeing you all out on the trails and talking to you on here. So uh, we appreciate everyone's support. So uh, without further ado, like I said, today we're going to be talking about wildlife babies. I am, oh, I hear somebody say that you're having trouble hearing me. So I'm trying to follow the comments um, on another device, but it's not necessarily updating as quickly as I'd like it to. So um, somebody says you're having trouble hearing me. If somebody wouldn't mind letting me know, I'm bringing the computer a little bit closer to me. I don't know if that's the issue. Um, letting me know if you can hear me better now, that would be great. Um, and in just a moment here, I'm going to switch the screen over to the videos and photos that I have so that way we can uh, see some more wildlife babies, one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, so again, my, my other device here isn't updating as quickly. So, um, okay, all right, and people are telling me now that you can hear me fine. Okay, all right, well then I'm gonna continue on. <laughs> um, let me switch the screen over here. Some of you may have already seen this screen. Um, when you first joined us, there it is. Okay, so um, many of you I'm sure can figure out what these little babies are. <laughs> they do look a little strange when they're very tiny, when they're first born, um, but these are, uh, these, these are tree swallow babies um, in a nest, that, nest box that we have here at the Stage Nature Center. So a few days ago we talked about some different types of birds and their babies. Uh, we did see some video of a bluebird, uh, bluebirds in their nesting boxes. So I, I mentioned that we have boxes out here, especially in our meadow area and off our trails. You may, if you have visited us before, you may have seen our nesting boxes. They are bluebird boxes, but tree swallows will nest in them as well, and um, which is great. We're also it's another native species that we want to support. And so we do monitor the boxes. It's part of a monitoring, Bluebird Box monitoring program here um, that's actually nationwide. So if you ever see one of our staff or one of our volunteers peeking into the boxes, it's because they are recording and checking what they see, how many babies there are, how many eggs there are, if the nest has been taken over by something else. Uh, they're recording all this data to help improve populations for birds like bluebirds and tree swallows too. So if you see that, that's what we're doing. And a couple of the videos that I have today are actually um, are actually from the one of our staff members, Miranda, who has taken some video when she has gone to check on the baby. So we're very fortunate to get to have that view. So again, these are tree swallow babies. And one way we can tell them from the tree swallow nest from a bluebird nest when we get them in the, in the boxes in the same area um, is that, well, first you'll see the adults, <laughs> tree swallows going in and out, but tree swallows like to line their nests with lots of feathers, um, whereas bluebirds typically do not. And you'll get to see what the bluebird nest looks like from the inside here in just a moment. But first, I'm going to show you some video that I took um, of the tree swallows going in and out of their boxes. Tree swallows do have a bluish color like bluebirds do, but their bluish color is more of a metallic blue. Um, and it's, it, as you can see here, they have white on the bottom side of their body. You can see as this one's peeking out the hole here, and they have kind of a metallic blue on the top, whereas bluebirds have, are more kind of like a, I guess you'd call it a royalish blue, and they usually have some rusty color on their chest. That's one way you can tell the difference, but they will nest in the same areas. And there are tree, tree swallows nesting in both of these boxes here in our in our meadow. Tree swallows are mostly monogamous, so they, for the most part, they have one partner. 
However, sometimes they have seen in some populations where they are where they have multiple partners, um, and these are in at, at low rates in some populations. And these these breeding pairs they form as soon as the females arrive at the breeding site in the spring. So when we see these couple different birds flying in and out of the boxes, these are the pairs that we're usually seeing. Although there has been some indication, we're not 100% sure, but some of the nests, tree swallow nests, have had a large number of babies, um, and the number of birds that we have seen flying in and out um, indicate maybe there's a few, more than two adults helping, but we're not quite sure. Um, it could just be the way that it seems to us. Because tree swallows, they don't normally have six, seven, eight eggs, but they can. They're, the eggs range from two to eight, although average eggs per season are about five. So that's typically, typically what you're gonna see with tree swallows. And they, they breed once a year. And it takes them, once they hatch, or once they lay their eggs, it's about a, between 11 to 19 days after they are laid that they will hatch. And they'll breed all summer, basically, so between May and September. So we'll probably be seeing these tree swallows around in the meadow uh, for a while. This is just a fun video I added here at the end <laughs> because there was a tree swallow just calmly sitting on the tops of one of the boxes in the meadow. Um, with a deer laying in the grass just munching on <laughs> some food underneath. Um, so if you come out to our meadow area right now, it's really exciting. We've been doing a lot of work in the meadow to restore it. We've been removing invasive species of trees like the autumn olive and trying to open up the meadow, ba meadow back up so it can help support meadow prairie type species. And one of the things that we did this past week, we're working really hard with some great volunteers and staff, was planting over 200 native, native plants with a variety of species in the meadow to help, help some of those natives come back so it's harder for invasives to take back over again. So if you're here walking around, you may see some flags in the meadow. And uh, a lot of those flags are where we planted natives. Uh, we ask that you not venture out into the meadow. You're supposed to stay on the trails anyway. But especially right now, if you're walking around the meadow, there are some areas where that, that don't have flags where we planted and we don't want to tromp on those little baby plants that we put out there. An another thing you may notice, some of you have were reporting this earlier this week, there was a snapping turtle that laid a nest in the meadow, which is really exciting. The river is not too far from it. And so there is an area where we have some flags so that way we don't accidentally tromp over the snapping turtle nest. It's, it's off the trail, so as long as you're staying on the trails, which is what we ask when you're here at the Nature Center, then you don't have to worry about um, bothering the nest. Okay, so remember I mentioned that some of this video is taken from our staff member who helps monitor the boxes. It's interesting to see how different species of birds react to people being around their babies um, and around predators around their babies. This is a video that our staff member Miranda took when she was checking the tree swallow nests. The tree swallows are a little bit more defensive of their nests than the bluebirds are, for example. And this is what she usually experiences when she goes and checks on the tree swallow nests. So the tree swallows, as you can see, they're, they're frantically flying around her, making a lot of noise. They'll even fly down towards her head <laughs> to kind of give her a startle to try to convince her to, to leave the area. So this is what tree swallows do when they are, are defending the nest if, if there's a predator nearby. Like I said, not all birds are this, um, this defensive of their nests, but tree swallows, they have been known to do that when we're checking their nests. So these are some eggs in one of the tree swallow nests. Again, you can see that their nest is lined with feathers. And then here is a nest with the babies. So they don't look like very much when they're young, <laughs> and a lot of baby birds look very similar to each other when they're this young. So depending on uh, the nest, if you don't, if you haven't seen the nest, it can be hard sometimes to tell the species if you just find a newborn hatchling like this because they don't have their feathers yet. 
Um, but if the nest is nearby, that is a good way to be able to figure out what kind of species that you're seeing. And here is some video that our staff member Miranda took of the babies inside the nest. So you can actually, what's really neat is without the feathers, you can kind of see the structures of the body. And one of the things that you can see here are those wings, <laughs> which are, are mod like look kind of like arms. Um, without those feathers, you can really see that. The mouths of baby birds are typically this yellowish, whitish color and that, um, that helps when the, the moms are feeding them. Those mouths really, they, when they stick open, <laughs> it really stands out to, to the mom or the dad, whoever's feeding them, um, and they find that mouth really easily. So after they hatch, it's usually a, their, the range that they spend at the fledgling stage is about 15 to 25 days. So between that 15 to 25 days, they are moving around more. They're trying to, um, this is oftentimes when people find young birds, baby birds on the ground is when they're fledging because they are not fully flighted yet, but they're practicing. And this is one of the things that I mentioned on Tuesday, but I'll mention it again, is that you have to be careful before you assume that a baby bird has been abandoned because sometimes it's just the baby on the ground learning to fly and the parents are still coming to feed it. They're still taking care of it. So there's you know several steps you wanna do if you find a baby bird on the ground. Um, of course, if it's bleeding, if it has an open wound, um, or if it's been in the cat's or dog's mouth, or if it's covered in fly eggs, these are some signs that this bird, baby bird needs help. Then you should contact a wildlife rehabilitator permitted through the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. If you don't see these things, and you, it's good to kind of observe, see if parents are coming and still feeding it before you assume that it's abandoned. But always, always check with a rehabilitator, tell them the full story before you assume that it's abandoned and before you assume or before you try to pick it up and take it somewhere. Now, it's a, common, um, it's a common misconception that if you touch the baby bird or other baby animals, that the moms will abandon them if you try to put them back. And that's just not the case. Most animals will not abandon their babies. I will say that for a lot of babies, it can be dangerous for you to touch them because sometimes they're born without a scent. And if you put that scent on them, they're more likely to attract predators or you could accidentally hurt them. But the, the mom will not abandon them. So you don't have to worry about that, but still try not to handle them if possible. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to Bluebird. I did show you guys some uh, Bluebird stuff on Tuesday. I'm gonna show you more today. This is a Bluebird sitting on one of the nests in the nest boxes. And I showed this video on Tuesday, but I'm gonna show it again today just because I was having some technical difficulties when I was trying to show these videos on Tuesday. Um, these are showing some of the bluebirds going in and out of the nest boxes. Now the experience has been is that they are not nearly as defensive of their nests as the tree swallows are. So like tree swallows, bluebirds are, are generally monogamous. So usually they have, have one mate, but again, there have been some research has some been some research that shows that maybe that's not always the case. They usually mate uh, during the spring and summer, and a mature female will typically raise two nests or two broods each season. And normally they'll lay about three to seven eggs per per brood with an average about four. For them, it takes about 13 to 16 days to hatch, and pretty similar to the tree, tree swallows, after they hatch, they're fledglings for about 15 to 20 days. So bluebirds are one of the species that are having a little bit more trouble because they so heavily depend upon that meadow type habitat. I think I talked about this on Tuesday that a lot of that type of habitat is being destroyed. So that's one reason they do the bluebird monitoring project of the nest boxes to help us keep tabs on them, see what we can do to help improve their populations. This is, a, this is the bluebird. It's got, it looks like a bug in its mouth that it's taking to the nest. So, uh, oh, and that was, <laughs> I was taking some pictures 
while I was taking the video, so that's what that was. So for bluebirds, and as you can see in the video, both parents cooperate in raising the babies, um, and they feed them a diet of insects. So I saw her, I saw them take caterpillars to them. It looked like some sort of, some sort of fly. Um, it was kind of hard to see though, for sure, what it was bringing. They were bringing a variety of insects to the nest, but the the female is more likely the one that's a little bit that's not quite as blue on top, and is a little bit duller than the male. The male here in this part is on the top of the box, but you can see that they're both working to take care of the nest. So in just a minute, I'm going to show you some video of the babies, um, and I'll show you what their eggs look like as well. So here's their eggs. <laughs> so their eggs are a, a, a kind of a bluish color like this. Like I said, they'll, they'll lay anywhere between three to seven eggs, but the average is about four, which we've got four here. This is a, a picture of the babies when uh, our staff member Miranda was checking the nest. They were begging for food, and <laughs> so they had their mouths wide open, um, hoping to, uh, or, or trying to get their mom to, to feed them. So when Miranda opened the box, they were probably think, waiting for mom to come feed them. Now when they're, when they're young, the fledglings are kind of grayish in color. Um, with a speckled breast, but as they mature, the blue color becomes more prominent. Here again, you can see another bluebird nest. Now, sometimes not all the eggs hatch, and that, that's the case in this nest, um, and in which case sometimes the parents will remove the eggs if, they, if, they're, not able to, if they're not able to hatch. So again, these are our bluebird babies. Very, very young hatchlings. Eyes are still closed. And here's some more video. They're starting to get some more fuzz on their bodies there. <laughs> Again, they're still of a grayish color, but as they grow, that that blue color will start to come in a little bit more. Um, I see some comments coming in, so I'm just going to double check here. Somebody said, are barn swallows same or different from tree swallows? So barn swallows are a different species from tree swallows. Um, they're they're very similar in that they're swallows and they they do eat insects and they're very similar in their flight patterns. But barn swallows are a different species, and they actually have some uh, a rusty color on their body, whereas the tree swallows have a white color on the bottom part of their body. So those are the bluebird babies that were in um, in one of the nest boxes. So this is another bird baby. <laughs> um, close up, you can kind of see the difference here. Um, this is a larger bird. I'm going to show you this video. And this was actually a nest not at my house, or not at work, but at my house. Um, this, this bird, and you can actually hear her or him talking in the background, they put their nest right on the top of one of the electrical kind of boxes outside of our house. So birds don't always nest in what we consider the best places for them. Um, and sometimes they nest in places that we don't want them. But here's the thing. They are protected by law. Um, it is illegal to move a bird nest, to move the babies, to disturb it if it's a native species. Um, so even if it's in a place you don't like, if it's a safe place for the birds, then you have to leave it legally until the birds hatch out. So this is these are some baby robins in, in a nest right at my house. And then I took some video of mom because she wasn't too happy with me um, trying to <laughs> trying to take video of the birds. She didn't attack me, but she was sure making a fuss. And uh, there was another robin, probably the male that was hanging out in the trees, making making a lot of fuss too. But she was definitely making much more of a fuss. So for robins, males and females, they form a pair bond during the breeding season and while they're raising their young. Their breeding season extends from about April through July, and they're one of the first birds to begin laying eggs. And they'll have about two or three sets of youngs or broods each breeding season. So um, after a pair is done that with their nest or with that brood, doesn't mean that they're not going to have another one. They might ha do have, an, have some more babies. And 
uh, here is a picture of an, another robin baby, not one that was from the nest. This was actually one that was found. Um, it may have fallen out of the nest. Um, not 100% sure, but it it was uh, it was it was nowhere near a nest that they could see, and so um, it was brought to us, and then we took it to a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, so again, if if it's become if it becomes obvious that the nest isn't around, the parents aren't around after observing for a while, you're not seeing that the parents are coming down to feed it, then that might be the case that it's abandoned. Again, the best thing to do is to contact a wildlife rehabilitator. They are pretty cute though, <laughs> if you ask me. This uh, baby robin is a little bit older than the babies that you saw in the nest. You can see here that this robin is still hungry. It's still begging for food. Um, and that's what they're doing when they open their mouth like that. So this video is actually of a, a pair of geese that nested here this year and they had babies near our pond, which was really exciting. So um, this was taken on my cell phone. So it's not quite as good as the, <laughs> the video footage on the camera, but these babies were just adorable. They had five babies. The, the parents were hanging around a long time around the nature center. When I put food out of the bird feeders, they'd come, they'd come over. <laughs> they were very defensive. So <laughs> even though I was putting food in the bird feeders, they would still run at me and hiss. And it was really neat because there was a couple times I was over at the bird feeders. Um, one time there was a, a great egret that flew into the pond or down to the pond and the goose ran and flew from the bird feeders back over to the pond to chase the great egret, which is a pretty large bird, away from the pond. At first we didn't see the nest, uh, but it turned out that they were nesting not right next to the pond, but not too far away off the trail, a little bit in a wet area. And we were very fortunate to get to see them after they hatched out. The parents brought them by. We only saw them for a couple days and then we didn't see them anymore. So they may have moved the nest or they may have moved the baby somewhere else since they were big enough to start moving around. Um, or, you know, it's always a possibility. It is a part of nature and we do have predators out here like uh, coyotes that something happened to them or maybe people. Um, unfortunately, it's possible. You've probably seen them trying to cross the road with babies before and sometimes that that becomes dangerous situation for them but it was really fun to get to to watch these little <laughs> fuzz balls <laughs> while they were hanging out around the nature center but uh, if you have been around a goose pair when they have babies you probably know that they are very aggressive so you don't want to mess with them they will chase you down <laughs> um, and try to chase you off so just better to just watch them from a distance So here is a gosling that was brought to us um, by, uh, I believe it was a teacher actually, who found this little gosling on a playground. Now, she had thought that it was a farm duck of some sort and brought it to us because it was completely by itself. It was you know, completely alone. And when she got it here, we realized, oh, that is not a farm duck. This is a gosling, <laughs> a goose. So this little baby, we did end up taking to, to a rehabber. Um, but it was, it was quite a bit of fun to see, <laughs> to see the baby while while it was here. It was pretty adorable. Okay, now sometimes in the nest boxes we will find other animals that are not birds, <laughs> such as this mouse. So here in uh, Michigan, two common types of mice. The white-footed mouse is especially common. The deer mouse is also pretty common. And they will nest in a lot of different places. We did have some try to nest in the beehive display that we have here when uh, the bees weren't in there anymore. These, they often will nest in the birdhouse boxes too. So early in the season when our staff member started checking the boxes for, uh, for birds and for nests, she found uh, a mouse nest instead. <laughs> so what they, oops, what they decided to do, 
here we go. What they decided to do was to um, to just leave the babies. Oh, here's the baby mouse. They are pretty cute. <laughs> to to leave the baby because they do grow pretty fast. Um, and they decided to leave them because they are native species. They are an important part of the food chain. So it's it's very they are an important part of the ecosystem. They feed a lot of different predators like owls and snakes, hawks, um, a lot of different predators. And these are the babies again. So they are an important part of the food chain. And actually, it's it's a really bad idea to try to get rid of them by using rodenticides because that can make the predators that will eat them also very sick. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you're trying to get rid of these guys. But they weren't causing any harm. They were going to be out of there pretty quickly anyway. So, um, so they they we left the mice until they were until they grew and and left the box themselves. This here is a raccoon, <laughs> a raccoon baby that was here at the nature center actually on the trail. So somebody came into the nature center and reported to us that they saw a baby raccoon laying on the trail. So we went out and checked it out and this little guy was laying on the trail. We think we knew where the nest was. It was way up in the tree, probably 25, 30 feet or more, if not more than that, up in the tree. And we did attempt to get a ladder to see if we could get up there to see if that if the nest was in this hole in the tree that we thought that's where it came from, but we couldn't get up there. So it is a good idea if you know where a nest is to try to return the baby to the nest so the parents can take care of it. Um, we weren't able to do that, so we did end up taking it to a rehabilitator so that way the rehabilitator could take care of it. Now, when handling these animals, you'll probably notice that I had gloves on. It, it is very important to wear to wear gloves because, uh, you know, just in case there's some kind of disease or pathogen or bacteria or something that they have, you don't want to pass on to you or get bitten. Uh, raccoons, it's, a lot of rehabilitators actually don't rehabilitate raccoons because they are uh, very difficult, but they can also possibly carry rabies. Now, not all raccoons carry rabies, but it is a possibility. So if you find something like this, you want to be very, you want to be very careful. And here is a baby squirrel that was brought to us. Actually, this baby squirrel was just dropped off at the nature center. Sometimes, unfortunately, people do just leave baby animals here. They'll leave them outside, um, or sometimes they'll leave them with somebody else, and somebody else finds the baby. Uh, we, you know, we ask that if you do find something, don't just leave it because you don't know how long it's going to be before a person will get to that baby. And in that time, while they're waiting for somebody to help them they might die. So if you ever do find an animal that you want to take somewhere, again, call first and make sure that you talk to somebody. Don't just leave it out there so that way they have a better chance. We did end up taking this baby fox squirrel to a rehabilitator as well. So these are some more animals around my that, I, that were around my house. It's kind of hard to see here what they are, but they're uh, one a couple years ago we were cleaning up in the spring. We had left a big pile of leaves out by our air conditioning unit. Springtime came and we decided to start raking up the leaves, or my husband did. I was in the house when this happened. And um, it's an interesting story because he comes running in the house and tells me, come outside, come outside. So I come outside and what happened was he was raking up the leaves and there was this little tiny, uh, a little nest of baby Baby, ra uh, baby rabbits, baby eastern cottontail rabbits is what we what they're called. And they make these little kind of depressions in the ground and they will use foliage like leaves to kind of cover up their nests and fur and stuff like that. Well, when he, let's see, I mean, when he found them as he was raking up the leaves, it disturbed the nest a little bit and one of the babies hopped out of the nest, as you can see here. Actually, a couple of the babies hopped out of the nest. And this... So what I ended up doing, because I knew the nest was there, is I did scoop it up and I put it back in the nest because I didn't want it to get, uh, I didn't want it to sit out in the sun and I didn't want a predator to get it while they were waiting for mom to come back. So I put, scooped it back up, put it in the nest, and then we covered the nest back up with the leaves so that way mom could come take care of the babies. And mom did end up coming back and take care of the babies. And it was actually a really neat experience because we got to watch them 
grow and we got here's some you're gonna see video now that I took of mom taking care of the babies we have a tri level so this is from our lower level and the window is right by where the nest was so we could watch mom taking care of the babies really easily and it was a really neat experience um, and we got to see them grow and spread out so rabbits are crepuscular and which that means is that they are most active at dusk and dawn so the mom is most likely to come back to the nest to take care of the babies at dusk and at dawn. So it is possible for her to leave them all day and you won't see her and then she'll come back. So that was, you know, the case here. And that's why I stuck the baby back in the nest um, because I didn't want it to, to be out and about while it was waiting for mom. And like I said, we covered the nest back up with leaves and then when they were all done growing and they were out of the nest, then we raked up the leaves. But that's one good reason to keep things like leaves around because a lot of animals will use them. This is a baby rabbit, one of the bunnies that was um, nursing off of mom. <laughs> and it was quite adorable, I thought. It was trying to lay on its back to nurse from mom. Um, so these these guys, you know, the... The, the females will have anywhere between one to seven litters per year. They average about three to four litters. And the gestation, so the time that they are growing in mom, is usually about 20, between 25 to 28 days. Now their breeding season starts in February. I think if I remember correctly, this, ape, this video was taken in early April. Um, but they, they will breed from February to September, and they'll have anywhere between 1 to 12 babies, although they'll have, on average, about 5 babies. And once they are born, it's, it's about 16 to 22 days that they're with mom. Um, after 16 to 22 days, they are weaned from mom. Um, and you'll still see them hanging around the area, but you might not see them as much with mom. And it takes them about 4 to 5 weeks to be completely independent. Of their mom. So if you find a lot of people will find baby bunnies that they're worried have been abandoned and um, or something happened to their moms. A lot of times again just you know because mom visits the nest at dusk and at dawn mom just might not be around. So a couple things to keep in mind is that again before you scoop up that baby and take it somewhere else the the wildlife mom, the the animal mom, is much more um, adept at taking care of those babies than humans are. So it's best to try to let the the mom take care of them. So you don't want to take them somewhere unless you abs you're absolutely sure that they've been abandoned. One thing you can do is if you're not sure mom has visited the nest, is you can put like a ring of like a ring of rope or a ring of sticks around the nest and then wait till the next day to see if it's been disturbed and if it hasn't been disturbed then that could be a sign that mom isn't isn't around anymore and then that might be a sign that you should do something um, about contacting a wildlife rehabilitator of course sometimes they get attacked by cats and dogs and if that's the case, then they might need to be taken to a wildlife rehabilitator if they've been injured. If you have one nesting in your yard, try to keep your dogs away from it. That's what we did. We have a dog, <laughs> and we just kept it away from the nest. I like this video here, part of the video here, because you can see the baby bunnies. It's on its back. It's it's laying on its back with its feet in the air as it's nursing on mom. <laughs> and it was just so adorable to get to watch. So again, before you... Before you take a bunny anywhere, please call the wildlife rehabilitator first, tell them the situation, and then get that arranged so so that way that way they are ready and expecting you and they can help take care of this baby bunny. And again, they won't the mom will not abandon their babies if you pick them up and if you try to if you touch them but it's always best not to because again that could cause predators to to be attracted to them now I picked up the baby bunny because it had it was very young it we had disturbed the nest and it, it left the nest and I knew exactly where the nest was and I felt it best to put it back in the nest cover that nest back up until mom could come come with them you may have noticed in my hand that 
I pulled up my sleeve over my hand since I didn't have a glove on me to, to cover to help cover my scent and also just in case because it is a wildlife and a wildlife um, in case it had any kind of disease or bacteria so it's a good idea to protect my hands okay and last but not least one of my favorite wildlife babies are fawns <laughs> um, they I, I actually grew up in an area where you don't see deer that much I grew up in South Florida and uh, we do have deer down there, but they're very rare, unlike up here um, in in Michigan. And so I didn't get to grow up seeing deer all the time. And uh, so I I love seeing them. I think they're they're really neat <laughs> to get to see. So the fawns here at the nature center have been. They, people started seeing them a few weeks ago. They were really small then, so the sightings were fewer and far between. Um, as I mentioned on Tuesday, just like the rabbits, the moms will leave them during the day and they'll leave them for up to 10 hours at a time. So the baby might be just looks like it's <laughs> abandoned, but laying down in the grass and it'll just stay really still because that's its instinct all day. So again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's abandoned. Now here in the video here in just a moment, this fawn was looking for a place to go and lay back down. And it'll, it's a really amazing how it just kind of disappears here. And there it goes. <laughs> and now you can't even see it anymore. Um, this, this next video here was the other fawn. We believe they were twins because they were hanging around together. There was a doe nearby. It was also laying down in the brush. And I, I had a really zoomed in lens here. But all I could really see from where I was standing was just the, the twitching of the ears. There were a lot of bugs out there. So <laughs> their ears were twitching a lot. But otherwise, if it wasn't up moving its head around and its ears weren't twitching, I probably wouldn't have even seen this this fawn. So that was the reason I was able to see where it was, it's because of those ears twitching a lot. Those, their ears really are quite big. But um, so you know, a lot of fawns will have will have one, maybe two offspring. Um, it's possible for them to have triplets, but it's very very rare for them to do this. They do breed once a year. Um, and so once those babies are born, they're taking care of them for a while. And right now, these babies that have been born over the past few weeks, they're starting to get bigger. They're moving around more. So it's more you're more likely to see them with mom. With mom. But again, just like the, the baby deer or the baby rabbits, you don't want to assume that, that they have been abandoned. You know, you, like I said, their moms will leave them for up to 10 hours a day. And then they'll come back and and take care of them. So just uh, so here's another video I got. So when I was out here yesterday, I was able to get this video. I was really excited to get it, because um, now some of the fawns are getting big enough where where you can where you can see them a little bit more easily. And when I was leaving, sure enough, the fawn had gotten up and mom was out there with it. So I was able to get a little bit more video. So if you find a fawn that's kind of laying by itself, you, you, try, you don't want to disturb it. As I mentioned with the rabbits, if, you're, if you touch it and you try to pick it up, you're putting your scent on it and that can cause predators to be attracted to it. So it's best to leave it alone. Now, of course, if it has an open wound or a broken bone, if it's covered in fly eggs, if it's cold or wet, especially, and if it's crying nonstop for hours, um, these are some signs that, that this fawn might need some help. Or if it appears weak and it's lying on its side, it appears weak. Um, if they're lying on their side, that could be an indication that something is wrong because normally when they're lying down, they're not lying on their side, they're lying kind of on their stomach curled up. But again, before you pick that up, have the temptation to pick up that baby, make sure you contact somebody first so they can kind of guide you through the process. And then always contact a wildlife rehabilitator. This little um, fawn looked like it was starting to test out some some leaves. <laughs> um, so it it uh, is probably a little bit older, but I was really excited to to get to see it. They're usually weaned at about 8 to 10 weeks. So I'm not sure that this guy is 8 to 10 weeks. 
um, they will start to nibble on vegetation a few days after birth. So they'll, they'll nibble on vegetation while still getting milk from mom. All right, I'm gonna check the comments here for just a second, see if I've missed anything, any questions. So if you come out here to the Nature Center right now, it's one of the a fun time of year to come because these fawns are popping up. Um, the deer here are quite used to people. And you know we are a nature preserve, so there's a lot of activities that we don't allow. So that way the wildlife is safe and it feels comfortable. If you do come out and they start walking up to you, it's like sometimes the fawns do, sometimes the parents do, don't feed it, please, and uh, don't try to pet it. They are pretty used to people, and sometimes people do come out and feed them, which is why they are so used to people, but uh, it is one of the regulations here not to feed the wildlife. So you can definitely watch them and enjoy it, but please don't feed them. It can be unhealthy for them, and it also creates bad habits where they are seeking out people, and sometimes that puts them in harm's way. Um, when they're trying to seek out people, but they are pretty, uh, pretty adorable. <laughs> it's like I said, it's one of my favorite times of the year to see all these fawns coming about. All right. So those are the videos and photos that I have to share with you today. I'm going to switch back over here. All right. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the Wildlife Babies Part 2 presentation. If you didn't get to see the presentation on Tuesday, I showed some other videos and photos of wildlife babies. Um, so you can check that out as well. And, uh, you know, one of the main reasons I wanted to do this was to help people understand a little bit more about wildlife babies. This is a common time of year where people are calling us um, because they have found a baby and they're not sure what to do with it. They're worried that something has happened to it, which we are so appreciative that so many people are concerned with them and that we're able to give you some advice. So the biggest thing is um, not to be a, a napper, <laughs> like a fawn napper, and to, to immediately assume that that animal is abandoned. Um, call somebody, tell them the situation, observe the situation before you assume that something is wrong and you need to take that baby somewhere else because you you don't want to take it away from mom. Um, so I hope this gave you guys some, some information. Um, I'm going to check the comments here one more time. Uh, hopefully it's updating. If I missed your question, I will definitely go back through after the presentation here and see if there were any questions that I missed and answer them in the comments. I hope you all enjoyed learning about these wildlife babies today. I hope you come out and see if you can see some of these wildlife babies or you'll probably see some of them around your house. It is the time of year to see that. So um, if you ever have any questions, again, please give us a call. 248-688-9703 is our phone number. If we don't answer the phone, please leave a voicemail and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Our building is open again. Um, staff hours are still a little, a little strange because we're trying not to have too many of us in the building at the same time. But we will do the best we can to get back to you as quickly as possible. And if you can't get a hold of us or somebody else, I would keep working down your list of contacts, especially Michigan Department of Natural Resources Wildlife Rehabilitators. Keep working down your list until you find somebody who is able to help you. Make sure you leave voicemails um, so somebody can get a hold of you. So. Um, Great seeing you guys again today. Um, I will see you again next Tuesday at 1 p.m. I'll do another live Facebook program. And like I said, I'll be doing these through the end of June. Uh, come on out to the Nature Center. Be safe when you do or be safe anywhere you go. I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. I um, hope to see you all soon if you live nearby. If you don't live nearby, uh, it's great that you're able to connect with us this way. Um, so uh, I, I enjoyed sharing all of these videos with you today. All right, well, I'm going to sign out here and uh, double check the comments, and then I'll see you next Tuesday at 1 p.m. All right, take care. Bye.